Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 13 to 16, then I'm going to jump down to verses 23 and 24. Uh, this is Jeremiah speaking. When he thunders, the waters in the, heaven roar. waters in the heavens roar. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. Everyone is senseless and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is shamed by his idols. The images are a fraud. They have no breath in them. They are worthless, the objects of mockery. When their judgment comes, they will perish. He who is the portion of Jacob is not like these, for he is the maker of all things, including Israel, the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord Almighty is his name. I know, O Lord, that a man's life is not his own. It is not for man to direct his steps. Correct me, Lord, but only with justice, not in your anger, lest you reduce me to nothing. We appreciate your service, and uh, I was thinking about this morning. We have a, a, a respect for people that serve in this way, and I think it's because of the, the matter of if you've served in the armed forces, you, uh, I, I think, Mike, you were the one that told it, you have written a check to the United States government, uh, cashable for up to your life that you're willing to lay down your life for your country? Are you willing to sacrifice something? And we respect that. And, and one of the things that we really grow to respect is when you hear stories of bravery and courage and boldness and heroism. And I want to tell you the story of a guy I worked with when I worked at the prison. His name was Russell. Uh, he's uh, since passed away. But he was a Vietnam veteran. And he shared a lot of stories with me. But I really started paying attention to stories actually after a fight in our unit. We had a guy in there. Um, for a while, he was nicknamed the Green Mile. And I say that because he was a big dude. Uh, if you, have you seen the Green Mile? You know that the dude was huge. Not that I recommend the movie. It's but uh, this guy was monster. And there actually ended up being later a much larger dude that, that regained that name. But this guy was huge. And he got into a fight. And we had these locker boxes, these metal boxes they would lock up their belongings in. And we had one that had all of our cleaning supplies in it. So it had about five gallons worth of cleaning supplies in this thing. And it's a big, heavy metal box. And, the, and this fight broke out, and this guy grabbed the box one-handed by the handle and raised it up to swing. That's how big he was. I, I mean, these guys, they would... They weren't allowed to have weights, but they'd lift with, like, bags of water and stuff, whatever they could get their hands on. And his arms were this. Now, Russell, the guy I worked with, I'm going to throw you under the bus, Justin. Picture Justin at 75. <laughs> Probably not the, the uh, a picture of intimidation. Sorry, Justin. <laughs> Maybe now. Maybe now he is. Uh, Russell was actually, he was almost 70, and he was uh, a, a smaller guy and uh, had grown frail. And uh, he stood up and got right in between these guys, and I didn't even realize he'd actually taken his handcuffs out and put them around his fist, iron knuckles. And he jumped in the middle, and he looked at that guy and said, if you swing it, I will put you down. I guarantee my body counts higher than yours. And the guy backed down. And I remember sitting there like, I wouldn't have had to jump in the middle of that. <laughs> so you're either really brave or a fool. And, and uh, I, I learned to realize Russell was brave. He had a boldness and courage. And so he began to share some stories about some of the things he'd went through. And he, he talked about one particular instance where they were hunkered down in this uh, makeshift bunker. And he said that his unit had been kind of dwindled down. Uh, later, uh, before he got out on that particular, um, what do you call it, uh, patrol? Uh, he ended up getting shot. Um, he actually went into a hut, and uh, he hesitated because it was a mom and a baby, and the mom pulled out a gun and shot him. And so he ended up getting shot later in this, in this patrol, but at one point, they had lost about half of their unit, and they were hunkered down in one bunker, and he said it was night, and it was just like they're coming out of everywhere. He said the enemy was coming at us from every direction, and he said we knew we were going to die. We just knew we were going to die that night, and he said, so we just made a pact, we are not going to stop shooting. And he said, they, they kept shooting. At one point, a couple guys actually climbed out and, and, and were fixed bayonets, and they were going at guys. And he said, when it was done, 
there was 22 enemy bodies on top of the bunker they were in. And the field was strewn, and there was, um, there was a small number of them that lived. And he talked about just the, I was like, in that moment, weren't you scared? He said, yeah, but there's a point where what you have to do overwhelms your fear. And I really learned to respect that kind of courage and boldness in him. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as many times as I talked to him about the Lord, to my knowledge, Russell passed away without knowing our Lord and Savior. Um, and I still struggle with that because he became a pretty good friend. But bravery. As we jump back into Nehemiah this morning, we're going to be looking at um, what you may look at and be able to glaze over and not realize it, but is probably one of the more bold, courageous moves in Scripture. And it's in the request of Nehemiah the king. So we'll be in Nehemiah chapter 2, if you want to turn with us there. We'll be camped out in the first eight verses of this for the duration this morning. Now it tells us to start, and I've referenced this already, that Nehemiah 2, we have a jump in time. We've moved ahead about four months. And it's, so it says the month of Nisan, so uh, uh, think April. This is a, it's not perfect equivalent, but think April. So Nehemiah started praying now. This is April. A lot of time passes between now and April, right? A lot of cold days, a lot of snow. You know, when I came up here and candidated, you all told me it doesn't get that cold and we don't get that much snow. That was the winter of 13 into 14. You all lied to me. But so there's this, this time passes, so a lot's gone on, and it tells us that Nehemiah was in prayer and fasting. And so this is a long petition. He is going before the Lord again and again and again. And it says, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Now, we've got to remember who the king is. We're going to reference that again in a moment. And he says, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, the scholars kind of rustled around, what does this exactly mean when he says wine was before him? Now, at the end of chapter 1, it told us that Nehemiah is the cupbearer of the king. So he's the guy that tests it and makes sure there's no poison in the stuff. And so when it says the wine was before him, we're picturing probably some sort of a banquet or a special event. Now, in a few verses, we're going to find out that the queen is there. Now, apparently, the queen um, didn't come out in big public events. Um, that was just not custom. Uh, I, I don't know why. Guys, do not read anything into that about taking your wives in public. We're not going there. <laughs> why are you smirking, Miriam? <laughs> And so we have, uh, we have this situation. So they're, they're in a banquet and stuff. And so Nehemiah, he's testing the wine. He's making sure it's okay. And he's taking it to the king. So that is the setting to start this out. And it tells us this in verse 2. He said, now I had not been sad in his presence. Now you have to understand something about the kings in these days. I mentioned it last time when I referenced the, the emperor's new groove. You cannot throw off the emperor or the king's groove. If you walk into his presence and you look sad, his assumption is this. You're in the middle of some conspiracy, especially the guy that's checking the stuff for poison. If he's sad, he's out to kill me, and it could be his life on the spot. And so he says he's not been sad in his presence. Now the other thing about this is interesting. Nehemiah has been praying and fasting. For four months. How many of you could go four months with something that is just wrenching your heart and no one knows about it? Do you see the picture here? Nehemiah is putting his request before the Lord, but he's not going around complaining. He's not talking about how hard it is or how much of a struggle it is. He's not making it obvious that he's under some sort of trial. He is just simply putting his petition before the Lord, and he goes about his business and his job like nothing's up. Now, I think this is an important concept for, for us to catch. And Jesus addressed this, actually, I think, in Matthew 6, right before the Lord's Prayer, which we covered back in the fall. Matthew 6, 5 and 6 tells us this. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love 
to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Today, as we look at Nehemiah, I'm going to be giving you some, some points of a theology of prayer based on Nehemiah, ne- Nehemiah's theology of prayer. And the first matter of prayer, according to Nehemiah, from this book that we have to get is this. Prayer, time in the presence. Now, I, I want to specify that. We have to say time in the presence of the Lord, because sometimes prayer is not necessarily me talking. It's not always me just sitting and listening. Did you know you can pray while you sing? I know I see some of you when, when we're up on the stage leading worship. Some of you are doing that. I think when, you, when you're just so moved and you're just, you close your eyes and you're just soaking, that could be prayer. Prayer, time in the presence, should never be perfunctory. What I mean by this, first of all, it's never about some token show. And I think what, when Jesus referenced these hypocrites, he said hypocrites, that's what they were doing. They were doing it for show. Now I say that as the pastor. Y'all ask me to pray over a lot. Right? We have Christmas dinner, and I, inevitably, I'm, Karen will probably say, hey, pastor, you want to pray for the meal? And I actually, something stirs in my heart a caution every time because I'm afraid I'm going to stand up and I'm going to give a prayer that's not to him. And we all do this, right? If you pray in front of someone, it's even hard if you're leading worship or you're, or you're just in, a, in your family meal or something. It's so easy to offer up a token prayer, this thing that I'm saying not really to God, but for all these people. We do it in prayer meetings. I, I, I used to laugh at, at our last church. There's a couple individuals that particularly did this. And, but, you know, you have this once in a while in, in even some of our small groups. The, the person that they pray but they're not really praying. They're just telling the rest of the group what's going on. Do you know what I'm saying? And what, I'm, what Nehemiah's theology of prayer is that it's his intercession is meant for the quiet. It's not for anybody else but the Lord. Now, we can pray in public. We do that in prayer meetings. But it's not for the people around you. It's for the king. It should never be perfunctory or for public recognition Public prayer is an outflow of private prayer. I, I've, I've said uh, to quite a few people, I think I can get to know the, a person really well, the best, if I pray with them. And uh, I, I pick on Miriam a lot, but uh, and leading up to the Deeper Life Conference, we did some planning together and spent a, a good time of prayer, and I walked away from it thinking, I know Miriam now, because I've heard her with the king. And as much as I pick on her, I love what I saw. Public prayer is an outflow. Now you can tell the person, and you know it, you've seen it, that when they pray in public, you sit there going, do they really know the king I talked to? Because it's, it's some sort of token. It doesn't even feel real. There's a difference between people who pray out of the overflow of their private life and people that pray because, well, that's what we're supposed to do because we're in church. And so Nehemiah, a theology of prayer, says that it's about the king and that it has to flow. Public, what the public sees has to flow out of the private life and it doesn't always have to show. A lot of times I think the Lord calls it for not to show, like we see in Nehemiah. He did not tell the king. Now, I think our, our prayer life and the things we're wrestling with has a time to come out. We're going to see that in a moment with Nehemiah. Well, he'll share his request. But we have to wait on the Lord for that. Sometimes he's saying, do not share yet. And so we see this with Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 2 goes on to tell us, And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing that you are not sick? There is nothing, this is nothing but sadness of the heart. And Nehemiah says, Then I was very much afraid. He had good reason to be. Now we, we need to understand, I say, that it's not just that you throw off the groove. This king, Artaxerxes, was arguably the most powerful man on the planet at the time. And so he's checking his servants. This is your boss checking you, but your boss has all the control in the world. I don't think we can even get our minds around this. He's saying, what's the deal here? You're acting sad. 
you're not sick, what's your problem? And he's scared, rightfully so. For all he knows, the king could order right at this moment Nehemiah's execution. So fear creeps in. He is afraid. But then Nehemiah responds. He says this. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Now, right away, we must acknowledge that although Nehemiah will start to show some boldness, he showed the king the respect that his, tithe, his office deserved. Now, King Artaxerxes was not necessarily, he was not a believer. He was not someone that we respected because of his high moral standards. Actually, when we get to the queen here in a, in a couple verses, the word there, it could have been his queen. It could have been just one of his favorite gals from his harem. So he's not exactly the standard of moral uh, fortitude here. I mean, the guy's got a whole slew of women, and he's, he, he's not necessarily a good guy. But his office warranted respect. So Nehemiah, as a godly man, respected the office. And he says this, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad? When the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. I want you to catch the switch there. Nehemiah is afraid, and now he says, you know what? I should be afraid. The place of my ancestors is ruined. I have a right to be afraid, a a right to be sad, a right to, to be stirred. But I also, he has a boldness, but I want you to catch Nehemiah's tact. He does not say, why shouldn't I be sad? Jerusalem's burned. Nehemiah keeps his plea personal. He doesn't make it political. This is a political issue, and I will tell you why. In on my PowerPoint.org, sorry guys. In Ezra 4. To Artaxerxes the king. So back in Ezra, they had started to rebuild the wall. And so people got upset, and so they wrote a letter to Artaxerxes. And this is what they wrote. Your servants, the men of the province, beyond the river, send greeting. And now, be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are finishing the walls, repairing the foundations. Now be it known to the king that if the city is rebuilt and the walls finished, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll, and the royal revenue will be impaired. It's saying, listen, this place has a history of sticking the proverbial middle finger up to the ruling entity, and you better not let them rebuild. Now because we eat the salt of the palace, and it is not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor. You hear that this is like brown nosing to wazoo. Because we are about you, king, we're bringing this to you. Now we know anybody that ever says this, they're doing this for their own reasons. But they're bringing this to the king and saying, listen, because of that, we're in order... Therefore, we we send and inform the king in order that a search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers. He's saying, look at the royal archives. You'll find in the book of the records and learn that the city is a rebellious city, hurtful to kings and provinces, and that sedition was stirred up in it from of old. That is why the city was laid waste. We make it known to the king that if the city is rebuilt and its walls finished, you will then have no possession in the province beyond the river. So King Artaxerxes, he writes back. He sent an answer, and starting in verse 18, the letter you sent to us has been plainly read before me, and I made a decree, and a search has been made, and it's been found that the city of old has, been, has risen against kings, rebellion and sedition have been made in it, and mighty kings have been over Jerusalem who ruled over the whole province beyond the river, to whom tribute, custom, and toll were paid. Therefore, make a decree that these men be made to cease and that the city not be rebuilt until a decree is made by me and take care not to be slack in this manner. Why should damage grow to hurt the king? Do you understand what's going on? Jerusalem is a political hot topic of the day. The enemies of Jerusalem say, you do not dare rebuild this. And Artaxerxes buys into it. He's like, yeah, you know what? The history shows 
They, they keep sticking the proverbial middle finger up to everybody. And so, no, we cannot do this. Every time they're, they're rebuilt, they, they start ruling the area. And so he says no. So in Nehemiah, in his plea, if he immediately says Jerusalem, he immediately makes it political. And I would argue that the moment we cross that threshold, if we take it from personal to political, I mean, there's a time and place, but in many times we lose our voice. And in this case, Nehemiah would have lost his voice with the king if he made it political. Now going back, my apologies for the... But Nehemiah, we see this switch. He, he keeps it personal, but he switches into a boldness. And I think if we're talking about a theology of prayer from Nehemiah, it's this. Prayer, time in the presence, should produce courage and boldness. And I'm saying should. This is not in the PowerPoint. This is extra. Exodus 3 and 4. Anybody know where the story is? What is it? For Bible scholars, nobody? Moses in the burning bush? So I want to remind you, just a, a, a quick thing. So in Exodus 3, we see Moses, he's, you know, out watching the sheep, and he sees this bur- bush on fire, right? And it's kind of cool because it's not burning up. And as he approaches, we know that God tells you, hey, take off your, sh- your sandals for the place in which you stand is holy, right? And he goes into the presence of God, and God begins to speak to him about knowing the plight of, of Israel in Egypt and slavery and that he wants to set them free. And if you read through chapter 3 in the front part of 4, we see God does some miracles right there. You know, Moses asks, well, how would they know? And God shows him. You remember he says, stick out your hand and your arm, and it was leprous. And then pull it back and stick it out again, and it was healed. And turn this, the staff into a serpent. He's showing him miracles. And then... In chapter 4, verse 10, Moses says to the Lord, after all this, miracles. Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Fear. He's been in the presence of fear. Now, notice, God initially is gentle to Moses. He says this. Who's made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Do you catch the gentle encouragement? This is your kid when they're learning to ride their bicycle, and you're saying, listen, you know, and they're scared, and you say, oh, listen, hey, go for it, I got you. And I say the presence of God, prayer should transform us, but in Moses' case, it doesn't. Moses says, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. And verse 14, I think, holds a really important truth. It says, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. I think the anger of the Lord was kindled because Moses has a real encounter with the living God, and he should have been transformed, and he wasn't. Now, flip over to Jeremiah, if, if you're following along with us. Brian, good job of pointing out how to find it. So Brian's the fan method. He's got some tabs on his Bible, I know that for a fact. I want us to look at the beginning of Jeremiah 1, tells us this. God says to Jeremiah, starting in verse 4, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then Jeremiah's response, he says, Then I said, O Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. It's the same issue. Listen, Lord, I'm I'm not eloquent. This is not me. I can't speak. And the Lord, again, gives him this gentle His initial response is gentle, and he says to him, Behold, I've put my words in your mouth. Now, right before this, sorry, in verse 9, Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I've put my words in your mouth. See, I've set you this day over nations, over kingdoms. 
God gives Jeremiah a gentle rebuke, a gentle encouragement. Then how does Jeremiah live after this? If you read the book, he is a bold prophet for the king. He proclaims God's word again and again and again. And Jeremiah actually, 20 verse 9, was a verse that, uh, that was, this is my call to ministry. And I think I even shared it with the board when I interviewed here. Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah, this captures Jeremiah's heart. After his time in the presence with the king, and out, as he serves the king, this is Jeremiah's heart. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as if it were a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary with holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Jeremiah's response to the presence is that I cannot help but do this thing. To boldly, courageously proclaim the word. And so, in Nehemiah, prayer, time in the presence, any time in the presence, should produce courage and boldness. You should be changed in the presence of God. Now, We see Moses shows you can enter into the manifest, literally manifest presence of God and not be changed. And I think some of the struggles in the American church is too often we come with this consumer mentality. We enter into the manifest presence where God is here. He has promised us in his word and we walk out those doors not changed. You should be. Boldness and courage. Conviction. Encouragement. Something should happen in his presence. And he has promised in his word that he'll be there. And honestly, quite frankly, a lot of times it's on us. It's our hard attitude. And so we see Nehemiah four months in prayer. And I think the key is this. He's in front of the most powerful man in the world. A king above all kings. But because he's been in the presence of the king, King Artaxerxes got nothing on him. Do you get that? That boldness comes because as I'm with the king, I am so changed that anything here doesn't matter. It really doesn't. It should produce courage and boldness. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. So this is the moment that Nehemiah has been praying for. He's been praying that God would give him favor with the king. And so we see him here, the king asking, him, what do you want, Nehemiah? What is it you're asking? And it says that he prays. Now, I think probably every person in this room, whether you believe in Jesus or not, you have, you have done that prayer. That fleeting, Jesus, help me, Lord, help me, prayer, right? In that moment where you've, you've done something stupid, let's be honest, and you're in a bad situation, and you in that moment, Lord, I need you. Students, I know we're in like college final time, right? We've done that. You like, in this moment, like, oh man, I did not study like I should. Lord, please help me, please help me, please. I actually think, in a lot of ways, people that use God's name in vain is essentially the same thing. That started, the root of that, is a calling out to God in a desperate moment. But we do this. We have these fleeting moments. And that's okay. Those moments, it's okay to pray. But I want you to catch this. Nehemiah prays there. But prayers in the moment find their power in hours on our knees before the moment of need. Do you get that? This, those fleeting moment prayers, they're, they're all right. But if you haven't been before the king at all, you can't, I, I'm just going to say, you can't expect much. Sometimes he still answers because he's a gracious, loving father. But I, I've known too many people that, you know, years of, 
uh, of, you know, years of a, a, a particular addiction. And then when it comes down to it and the diagnosis is there, it's a desperate cry like, Lord, let it not be this. Or years of unfaithfulness to a spouse. And in the moment, Lord, please, no divorce. Prayers in the moment find their power in hours and hours and weeks and months on our knees before the moment of need ever arises. And so we see Nehemiah pray. He's like, Lord, give me the right words here. I've been waiting for this. And he says to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, again, the respect for the office, that you would send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. Now, he still doesn't call Jerusalem outright Jerusalem, but he's getting there. And he's asking him for, for this. He's asking for a very specific thing. And so the, ex, the next thing that we can take from it, and the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? Now this is a logical question, right? The king, he's like, hey, king, can I have some time off to go do this thing? Well, if you ask that of your boss, probably the logical question, well, how long do you need, right? Um, I, when Bethany was born, my boss, how long do you need? You need like two days? And I said, not if I want to stay married. <laughs> he said, a week? Yeah, two? Uh, I, I was a podunk company, and they, we didn't get much. And so I got two weeks of unpaid leave. Woohoo! <laughs> but this, there is an interesting thing in this verse. We see him mention the queen. Now, I said the word queen here is really vague. This could have been the queen. This could have been one of his favorite gals from the harem. Uh, the word is actually used interchangeably in the, in the language at that time. So we don't know, but there's a lady sitting there, one of, the queen, one of the king's gals. Now why? Why does he say the queen sitting beside him? I think if you're a guy, you know why. That moment when you get the elbow in the ribs because you're not noticing something your wife thinks you should. Anybody been there? Anybody been there during service? <laughs> That's what it is. I think Nehemiah mentions it, and that's a lot of scholars think. Maybe she had, you know, maybe he was a favorite, even with her. We don't know. But I think it's, it's noted because that maybe she had some influence. And so he asked him, how long will you be gone and will we return? He opens the door to Nehemiah. Here is his moment. So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. So Nehemiah doesn't record exactly what the time he gave, but he had a very specific time. Now, anywhere in the business world, we know ambiguity does not behoove us, right? If your boss asks you what you need and you start getting really like, well, you know, I, I don't know, I need, uh, they're not going to give you. Nehemiah gave him a very specific thing, and I think this gives us our next point in a theology of prayer from Nehemiah. Prayer should produce a plan for action on our part. Nehemiah is praying about a specific thing. And so he had not just been praying, Lord, do something. He had been praying, okay, Lord, I am trusting that you're going to do something. When he gives me the opportunity, Lord, what should I ask for? I don't think he got this in the moment. I think he'd been praying about it, praying about it, and he did some legwork. He started to understand, well, you know, it's going to take this long. And we know later that they built the, law, the wall in record time. So I think not only was he praying, I think he was praying and saying, you know what, it should take us this long, but I think you're the God of heaven, I think we can do it less. You see the faith welling up here. He has planned he has asked God for an open door, and then he's asked God, when the door opens, what do I do? Now, sometimes the plan for action in prayer will be, wait a little longer. And that's okay. But we should not hide behind that, where we wait, and then when he does open the door, we're not ready. Uh, in our journey here, Wendy and I actually were looking for a church like two years before we saw you guys before we met y'all and fell in love. 
uh, our church, uh, I got licensed, and they weren't doing anything. They weren't hiring and stuff. And so I was like, well, you know, um, 10 hours a week isn't cutting it. And so we started looking. We were interviewing and stuff. And Wendy and I kept getting weight. And we're like, wait, Lord, this ain't working financially. And then just all of a sudden, the board came to us and said, hey, we'd like you to stay for a while. We'll commit to paying you full time. And that lasted for a year, and then we all joined you all because they couldn't afford us anyway. But sometimes it's wait. Sometimes it's be patient. But prayer should produce a plan for action on our part. And he says to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me, to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. Now we know, if you look ahead in Nehemiah, he gets sent with an escort. He's got a band of soldiers. And so, yes, this is a practical request. He's, he's prayed and he's thought, you know what, Lord? Yeah, that's it. I better have something from the king because if I go marching through his territory with a bunch of people, they're going to assume rebellion. So I need a letter, king. I need a letter to these governors to let them know I'm on your behalf, that they may let me pass through. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And so he had prayed this through. Do you realize the faith in this? He had prayed, and he's like, okay, Lord, yeah, if he says yes, I'm going to ask him for all the materials. I, I don't even know if we can think of a modern equivalent. Hundreds of thousands, millions today. Lord. So he asks him very specifically for these things. And even down to the smaller detail. Listen, King, I have to live somewhere. And most of the houses are really bad. It's hard to find a rental in Jerusalem right now. So I need some extra to, to rebuild the house I'm going to stay in too. Do you see the boldness in that? But that boldness came out of careful planning in prayer. And so it tells us this. And the king granted me what I'd asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. I love Nehemiah's heart. As he pens this, probably years later, he says this. It happened because of God. Um, one of the things I really appreciated uh, uh, with our speaker, Mark Porter, um, talking about big butts in church, remember that? He said, but God and uh, I don't know if any of you saw um, the, the one uh, gentleman that he had shared uh, about uh, Joe. Uh, if you're friends with Mark on Facebook, he posted they had, had a celebration about his six months of sober. And uh, he was presenting him with a certificate. So if you want to get a picture of, in your mind of who Joe is, you should look up Mark on Facebook. But it's, this is it. Nehemiah is saying, this is because God, but God. He recognizes that I would have failed, but God. He recognizes that every good thing, every positive thing in my life is because of God. And so the last thing, though, with that, I, I think there's a tinge where he recognizes this leading. He's saying, this all worked out because I was walking the path that God set before me. And so I think the last point of theology from this section a prayer is this. Prayer gives us confidence in what the will of God is for our situation. He says this happened because of God, I think because he discerned as he prayed, like, I know what God's, God's will is for me to boldly ask the most powerful man in the world to fund me rebuilding a city. And at the end he says it was because of God, because it was the will of God. Prayer gives us confidence in what that will is. I think too often we hide behind the idea that I, I, I don't know the will of God in this situation. And, and there are times when he doesn't reveal it to us. But there's times it's because we haven't prayed. Nehemiah prays. He knows the will of God. And when God grants him the thing that he had dreamed, the, the dream he had birthed in Nehemiah's heart, he says it is because of God, the good hand of God upon me.
we can all give testimony, I think, at times in our life to that. I used to, uh, I remember this very specific point. I was in high school, it was 6 p.m. on a Thursday night when I felt called to ministry. And I remember dreaming, God birthed this dream, that someday I would get to proclaim his word to people I loved. And so, uh, even as I finished this, uh, I was praying over this this morning, I thought, I stand here because the good hand of God was upon me. So, uh, I'm going to invite the worship team up and uh, let us pray.